Oh, can we just take a deep breath because that last iteration of technology, that's how I feel about that. So that's all I will say. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to Insights. For those of you who have been waiting for the last 22 minutes, we want to give our apologies. This, you know, lunar eclipse has been messing up all technology. And so we've been on a journey trying to figure out everything between Facebook and the Lives and all of this stuff. But we made it. We are here. We are three. Our faces are very large for some apparent reason, but that's okay. I'm here with my two very good friends, uh, doctors, John Gill and Dan White Hodge. This is the after party for those of you who have no clue what we're talking about. Don't log off here, but I want you to go and check out the uh, latest Profane Faith episode where I kind of take over uh, Dan's podcast so that we can celebrate the last decade of his work and his pivotal writing of The Soul of Hip Hop. So all of the questions there about the book and about its influences and about where he is 10 years later, you can check out that podcast. Today though, uh, we are joined by our good friend, John, and we're gonna just talk about the current state of theology and hip hop. We're gonna talk about how the influence of Dan's work and others in the field have kind of shaped everything that's happening right now as we think it has become so broad and everybody wants to talk about it and put it on their syllabi. And I mean, I don't know if that's actually happening. I hope that that's happening, but um, we're gonna have some really interesting conversations. Hopefully we'll get a, uh, questions about a top five and the state of hip hop today and how everything is going. And remember hip hop is not just music, it's a whole culture and so it encourages and it involves all kinds of different aspects. For those of you who are uh, friends of Dan or uh, friends of mine and wanna kind of hop on and talk about how Dan's work has influenced you. Let us know in the chat. We'll either add your message that you post, or if you want to make, you know, a special appearance, we'll try to see if we can get you to hop on the show and do like a special. Hey, so before we get started, just wanted to check in with two of you. How are y'all doing? Oh, go ahead, John. You the man. <laughs> you are very muted, sir. You're not muted on here, but you're very quiet, and I'm not very good at reading lips. Still can't. Yeah, I haven't learned that art yet. No. Yeah. Still. Okay. I can um I can go while well, as, as as brother Doctor Gill over here is <laughs> I, I you know getting that audio set up um yeah I'm hanging in there I'm hanging in there we're um into the summer um for those of you who don't know I'm an avid um. A uh, grass grower, so uh, not uh, not uh, not the marijuana. I don't have my own uh, TMZ. What is no 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 the uh, what is what do they call it here in Illinois? Because it's legalized. Yeah. Yeah 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 yeah. It's legalized TMZ's here. Kind of, uh, reporting space. This is right. <laughs> yeah yeah yeah. yeah. I'm not I'm not a I'm not a legal place yet to to do that. But I I'm, I'm talking about like uh, tall fescues and Kentucky bluegrass is is the is the And 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 the suspense will forever kill me. I don't know where he went, but um, I'm sure we'll learn more about Kentucky grass a little later. John. Oh, Dan gone. Oh, you're you're. I can hear you now. You can I have me. no okay. clue. Dan has been raptured. Um, no, he's back. He's back. That was a, the quickest rapture ever. They were like, what? "Oh, my bad, wrong what? person." <laughs> what? I have no <laughs> idea what just happened. That's that's. Right, the right. I could hear y'all. I did rapture, oh. but I I kind of stayed in my clothes so that yeah, the old you, uh, don't press any James of the buttons Cameron. At the I think you Kirk may have Cameron. cut yourself out. I don't know what happened, but they raptured <laughs> you. Wasn't like what? The, is it really? I'll, I'll touching everything. Okay. Send him back. Send him back. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so you were saying Kentucky bluegrass? Oh yeah, no, I was just saying that it's uh, it's a nice uh, step away from just kind of the grind of the academy to get out and actually see some great results in the lawn and been working with that and it's it's a lot of fun to kind of get into that. So I'm 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 doing all right. We're getting some good natural irrigation, some rain today. So I'll take it. Nice, nice. There's no rain here, and I'm hoping that it kind of stays the way it is for all of them. We have this delusion 
between the end of May and June in Southern California, where we think like the summer is going to be awesome. The temperature is perfect. And then everything shoots up in July and it just stays yeah. that way through October. And you're just mad because you just are. But then the rest of the year is nice. So not too much to complain about, but enjoy that irrigation, sir. So yes, John, I kind of want to start with you just about in terms of like where you land in this story of influence in the last 10 years in theology and hip hop and how Dan's work specifically has, you know, helped to shape some of your thoughts um, as a scholar and as a lyricist right. and as a DJ and as a, and as a, and as a, and as a, you know what I mean. <laughs> You, <laughs> shout shout out to Doc. You know, I'm I'm really glad, Tamisha, that that you set this up because you know we got to we got to present these accolades while people are here. You know, so I mean, you know, and, 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 and Doc, you're gonna be around it for a long time. I'm just saying, you know, you know, you know, I'm <laughs> I mean, I'm glad that we're doing this on the on the 10 year anniversary of the Soul of Hip Hop, which really changed some things. For mm. for not only me, but for the way the Scott uh, 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 had been done for so long, because I think that you have the, of course, mid '90s stuff that begins with Dyson, and you know this work where 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 people we begin to have these discussions in the academy, um, and then you have a theoretical angle that kind of comes in the in the in the late 2000s with um with the work of Dr. Monica Miller um and Dr. Anthony Penn, Christopher Driscoll, et cetera. So you have these these angles that kind of look at the tradition of hip hop from a from a really really critical standpoint, which is great. And then then you have Dan come in, and <laughs> and and Dan's commitments, you know, um through his relationship with evangelical christianity at one time now i know he's an ex-evangelical but um <laughs> it, at this time you know when the yeah. soul of hip-hop comes out we see dan doing both we see dan doing this really really he's taking the spirituality seriously and he's still doing like doing this this critique of it and so i think for me that was really really helpful mm -hmm. as hmm. someone who has also been a part of that tradition and still is and has kind of come to a, a point of critical theory but i still think it's something that hip-hop does it can't be analyzed by the critical method itself so i think that dan's work from the soul of hip-hop on and hip-hop also gospel is one of my favorites you know um but i think he's given us a way to do both you know and to be authentic to both so i just got to say thank you for that doc you know you've done a lot man Means a lot coming from you, man. I, I appreciate it. Yeah, it's kind of hard to to believe. I mean, I was and, and I was literally just sitting around thinking. I was like, wow, in twenty twenty, right? It's twenty twenty one now. But I was like, wow, it's been ten years. And of course, what a ten years it was. But yeah, I, I appreciate that, man. I and and you know to hear that. So thank you. So let's talk about what was happening that was significant ten years ago at the intersection of theology and hip hop. Take me back. Oh, well, I mean, I, I think for me, it was, uh, I think we, a lot of folks were trying to figure out like, what is this, this religion? What is this hip hop? What, you know, how, how do those things come together? Um, when I started writing the book, um, well, I had, I had had the idea prior and I, I took it to a, a publisher and they were like, well, you know, we're not sure, you know, the market's kind of saturated right now with hip hop and theology books and Ephraim Smith and Phil Jackson's book. You know, for those of you who don't know, you know, there, there's what is the hip hop church, I believe it's called. Um, and that book had dropped. And that was really the only one. Meanwhile, I, I always say this, right? Meanwhile, there was like, you know, 50 white guys writing on the emergent church. That was kind of the talk of all the time, right? Is everybody's writing on the emergent church. But, you know, you telling me that the market is saturated, we got one book. So I had to wait, this was right around 2005, 2006, and I was finishing up my doctorate and trying to formulate how I wanted to create this understanding of what a hip hop theology was. I think this was right kind of at the tail end of the, I mean, I started writing at the at the height of kind of the, the Great Depression, the second Great Depression, right? The housing crisis, the market crash, um, it was a JB Fields hip hop church. Yeah, exactly. Um, you know, and and so there was a sense of like, 
okay, whoa, the world is 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 a little strange right now. And I think with Tupac's 10 year anniversary in 2006, right, him being dead, there was a sense of like, a lot of cats were like, all right, you know, they thought, oh, he's gonna come back, he's gonna come back. Like, no, he's not gonna come back. I think, it, you know, in 2008, when I started writing, I wasn't even sure, you know, how this was gonna even get, you know, published, but I was like, I know I need to get it out there. I, I, I know I want to establish some kind of sense of hip hop and theology. And at that point, I was still looking at it, like John was saying, you know, kind of through this evangelical lens, how can we use hip hop? But I really wanted to go beyond just a tool of a missional mindset, right? But actually embrace it. And so hmm. these were all new conversations in a lot of different spaces. Folks weren't necessarily having these. And so it was, I remember the, really the, one of the first, John, you can correct me. It, this was in San Francisco AAR. And I just remember kind of the energy around that group of critical approaches to hip hop and religion. And I mean, the room was packed, right? Like, well, here we are having a conversation around hip hop, religion, and like I said, the room was just packed out on people just trying to, and, there, and it was like you, people could, you could just feel that people wanted to know more about this around that around that time. Hmm. So the solo hip hop dropped right at kind of the peak of that that movement of saying, what is hip hop and religion, and how do we begin to look at this from different perspectives? If that makes sense. Yeah, no, that makes total sense. John, you got anything to add to that? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I think that's really, really powerful, Doc. Um, yeah, it's. You know, especially when you look at the timeline, because I think you're talking. To, I I want to say that Dr. Miller set up the AAR critical approach to hip hop and religion in 08. I want to say right, and then the conversation. I think so yeah, some some like that. Yeah, and, and then and then as you said, you said about the meeting in San Francisco, and then the conversation began to build this energy at that time, and it becomes this really, really, it becomes this thing at least in that region that kind of is starting to get some serious steam about it, especially the critical approaches part of it. You know, mm -hmm. and so Dan's work, I think, is very important in that timeline because it does something. It it, it it adds something different to that. Yet it still does a lot of things at the same time. Yeah. So when you think about like that difference, right, and you talk a little bit about being um, an ex-evangelical or post-evangelical. I don't know what the term actually is anymore, um, but you're no longer an yeah. evangelical, but you you were trained or you grew up in, in those spaces. I think yeah. that um, there's something super interesting about that too. Like I, I, I didn't grow up evangelical. I am trained at an evangelical institution, but I think it's really interesting to think about um, the approaches to hip hop and critically, academically, and the approaches to hip hop as it related to like ministry, right? And I remember growing up in spaces where it was like, you threw all of your records away, your cassette yeah, tapes, right. your CDs, I'm aging everybody in the room right now. Um, but then you, <laughs> but then what we learned is we immediately replaced it with a Christian version of, you know, so if you like this group, you'll love insert right. hip hop artists here. And right. it's like, there was everything. There was like all kinds of hip hop. There was neo soul. There was reggae. There was rock. There was like anything that you listen to in the world, right? I don't know where my camera is. Obviously, um, you can find a version of a Christian message for. It. And I and then I think that like for me, that was you know growing up as a young you know a young person in church. Like that's what the intersection was, or that was all that was made available to us as an intersection of the allergy and hip hop, completely separate from the actual experiences and the actual like connections, the spiritualities, the transcendence that I experienced growing up watching my brother battle rap in Long Beach, right? Like growing up like, as a young girl, like standing on the side of a cypher, listening to this brilliance, right? And experiences I had there, that was enregistered spiritually. But to listen to, you know, the truth and you know propaganda and you know ambassador and all of these folk like that's really where you know god was in hip-hop so talk to me a little bit about um that distinction that difference well i mean now i mean i i don't necessarily even see the difference but back then it was like if you even want to call it and again brother gill i know has got some great insight on this when you think about even the genre holy hip hop. I know we as scholars kind of 
you know, we try to problematize that a little bit because what is holy hip hop, right? How do we define mm. that? And and that genre really is is looked at in in a certain regard. It's almost like diet soda. It's like here you got this soda with all the sugar, but here you know same great taste, less filling, right? Um, and I'll just put all my cards on the table. I've never been a fan of. I tried it, and I just never been a fan of holy Christian, whatever you want to call it. I never got into it. Mainly, now that I have some more context for it and some more language for it, mainly because it repeated some of the same theological elementary forms of approaches to God. Um, and I was just like, that's just not the way life is. Life doesn't operate in the binary. We don't just, oh, my gosh, I'm going to go get saved, and then life is better. That doesn't work that way, right? And all these artists wanted to do was really just center being saved, being saved, and you know, in this kind of binary that exists between the world and the secular. And I'm like, I just, I don't see the world that way anymore. And through research, through my own, and having conversations at places like AAR and and and, and brother with brother Gill and, and Monica Miller, and talking with some of these other cats, I'm just like, we can't just look at it in just this again this space. And so for me. I began to see, okay, well, if we're going to label it a holy hip hop, then we have to look at artists like DMX, the late DMX, mm -hmm. God rest his soul, and also look at that as Christian hip hop. Just because they say a couple of F-bombs here and there, as as somebody who studies rhetoric and, and discourse, we have to begin to look at what is the connotation of this? How how is this? How are these words being used? Jesus himself, right, used strong language, and dare we say, cursed somebody out. Um, and then that took me into different spaces and then began to see, okay, well, Monica Miller's work, how do we even define religion, <laughs> right? Mm. How do we even get into an understanding yeah. of that? And are people just saying this to sell records, right? Is Kanye simply saying, I want to do this so that he can do go do Sunday's church so he can go sell some albums? Because I don't hear too many people talking about Kanye going to church now, right? It's like, hell, he done sold albums. So we have to look at the marketing entertainment perspective of this. I remember a rapper came out, this is about 21 years ago, name was BBJ, came out on a Christian label, sounded just like, you know what I'm saying, John, I know John. Biggie, he sounded yeah. just like Biggie. Just, just <laughs> like Biggie. And his whole thing was like, look, I wanna be able to speak to the masses. I'm, I'm not trying to speak to other Christians. I wanna go out into the masses. The label didn't know what the hell to do with that. And mm -hmm. consequently, Christians looked around like, what the hell is this? And of course, it never made it into the spaces he wanted to go into. This cat was amazing, right? And so that, that's a prime example of just kind of the disconnect. And we, because I mean, I know this just from being an author, Christian publishing, what's that? They still trying to sell books. Somebody still got to pay for the microphone, keep the lights on. And shoot, we talking about having to pay for all this damn software. Somebody's got to pay for it. So they're about trying to sell stuff. So this idea and notion of that, Capitalism makes its way right into those conversations. So I think we have to begin to ask those broader questions. And for me, as somebody who once upon a time only centered salvation, right, as the only form of religion, I can now look back and say, wow, you know, how, again, one dimensional that is, mm. rather than actually holding some things in tension. Mainly what a lot of hip hoppers do, right? Sexuality, <laughs> right? How we look at the world around us, questioning forms of authority. Um, and that for me is is also engaged in the day to day. Uh, and if you wanna use the secular term, the sociological definition of that, hmm. you know, which is just the engagement of the day to day, right? The ordinary, how do we then live life in those spaces? Uh, as John Michael Spencer would say in Theomusicology, how do we look at it, the sacred secular uh, and profane, but let me stop there. I know y'all got some insight as well. Now, I just want to man. I just want to just jump in right, right. Just because kind of, I have a few things you just said, Doc, and what you said to Misha too. Um, you mentioned um, propaganda, which is a very interesting case when it comes yeah, yeah. to the distinctions between the sacred and the profane. Yeah, and it also asks the question: Well, is there a distinction? Because, um, and you know, Doc and I, we talk about tunnel rats all the time. Propaganda yeah. is a part of a crew called uh, tunnel, rats. tunnel rats. Yeah. Yeah. And they, in the main frame of Christian hip hop, just didn't give a fuck. They were like, look, we believe in, we believe in hip hop. We're, now, they never relinquished their evangelical commitments. 
But they did say we'll battle your ass on site and we'll probably destroy you. They right. did say so. They so, were the right. furthest out you can go. Like when you really yes. want to get back into the, you're like, well, at least I can listen to the. That's right. And that's what I told my mom. That's, yeah. that's what I told my, I'm like, I, I'm yep. like, look, look, look. It's not Wu Tang. I was playing that too. I'm like, it's not that. But they're doing basically <laughs> the same thing. And it's and it's but right. because, but see, that's a very interesting case because then you come to these notions of, well, where do you draw the line, or is there a line mm -hmm. at all? You know, I talk about borders is things that borders are imaginations you know they don't really exist but we utilize them because they perform a certain social function to get back to what um doc was saying you know using spencer's definition of the sociology of of, of you know musicology you know um what does and then this goes back to how miller and penn use a definition of religion well when you say religion all you really have to be saying and now I like the fact that Dan allows us to say more, but really all you have to be saying is, well, how is meaning manufactured in the world? Mm -hmm. So, yeah. so when it comes to that, well, then everything is religious, you know. And yeah. and and another example of this is Boogie Monsters, and they, you know, um, me and my <laughs> friend Maria Jack, we talk about Boogie Monsters all the damn time. We used to listen to that shit growing up. And now, now they're a good example as well because the Boogie Monsters were Seventh Day Adventists, as you were, Doc, at one time, right? Now, right. the thing about it is they no one really knew that. If you listen to the if you listen to the record, but I mean they were on the same label that Diggable Planets was on. Mm. Now oh, that's right. They they were on Pendulum, same I, as Baha Amadea, the same as a lot of people. I, so I, it's it's amazing, right? Because and even to go further, now they're doing this whole apocalyptic type of theology, and people just hear it as hip hop. They didn't know there was a such thing as Christian hip hop until 97. This is after their mm. second record came out. Mm -hmm. And they were just, they were like, oh, we didn't know this thing existed. You know, so, so are the Boogie Monsters secular hip hop or the Boogie Monsters Christian hip hop Ooh. or are the Boogie Monsters in a category that transcends border? And, it, and really, if they are, that's, that's great. Is, there, is there a border at all? Or have, have we just made it up? That'll preach. And, and I'm wondering if that, that concept of transcending borders is something that is just at the core of hip hop, right? At the core of the yeah. core itself. And and the very notion of like creating distinctions and borders and, and just kind of pushes back against what hip hop is at the core. Now that's totally different than a differentiation of sound, <laughs> of region, of all of those kind of things. But like the strict lines in which we build up, especially as it create as it pertains to religion and particularly Christian religion, right? Like we create this level of distinction so that we can then regulate, include, exclude, or claim. And this is, you know, I saw a lot of this happening, you know, mm. when DMX passed away, right? There's a lot of claiming about, you know, I like who, that. who he was or like a justification of his art and his talent because he prayed or because he was Christian, right? Like in a sense of like trying to remove a lot of the complexities that were just a part of his life, right? And, uh -huh. and from those complexities in which he led with his faith, right? And so it's trying to, the sense of like these borders are trying to tidy up how we understand artists, usually posthumously, usually after, you know, they have left us right. and passed away in a way to claim them within a certain territory that we don't have no business trying to claim our own in the first place. And so I'm wondering, John, if to speak to this notion of borders, right? Of these constructs of the imagination and the claiming in which particular Christian spaces have on particular artists, especially who do not categorize themselves as Christian artists. I'm a, yeah, I'm gonna say one thing and then I'm gonna pass it off because I know Doc has has a lot <laughs> written has written a lot on this. But, no, but go for it, man. Go for it. Come on. But but yeah, I mean. This is a very interesting point because, and, and there's you speaking to DMX, rest in peace to the God, first of all, man. You know, great, yeah. great artist, great human. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but there's this video, and me and my friend Mike, we watch this all the time. It's it's him on it's DMX on Tim Westwood, and he goes from these hood stories to first of all, look like you know what, and, and I think he was talking about Ja Rule. He's 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 like remember Chicago, uh, ironically, he's like, look. I could let you die out there, but I didn't. 
Then he goes through all this stuff and he goes through all these standing. And then he, then he ends with, now let's pray. And, and some people would say, oh, let's just talk about the praying part. Right. No, let's talk mm-hmm. about when he said, no, this is, this is the way you rob people. This is the when I when I wanted to rob somebody. This this is what I did. You know, I'm a peaceful man, but I'll still beat your ass. You know, you know. Now 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 he's saying all this, but why do we jump to that first? All of that is all of that involves the religious. You know, all of it. Yeah. You know, the yeah. religious is not just the and I and I and I think that artists like DMX, you know, embody that. But as you said to me, should people want to jump to the explicit phrases that refer? to whatever version of confessional religion they want to talk about. Hmm. That for me was revelatory once the book came out and I started really engaging in a lot of the scholarship was like, again, it, it's easy to pick out the lyrics that sound great, right? And I think that's part of what, again, going back to theomusicology is, is trying to do is it's trying to ask, like, how, you got to take it all in there. Are they really saying this? We can't just overlook some of these other things that are going on because it's real easy to just take a lyric. And and also with that, it's easy just to look at lyrics and completely avoid the other 98% of the artist's life. Like, what are they doing off camera? Um, you know, and today we live in an arena where we can access all that. I mean, you can just go to YouTube. I think about when I was doing my research on Pac, I had to go down to UCLA. They got a big you know, library at the basement there. They got all this stuff in media. So I had to dig through files and all that. Now, literally all them damn interviews are somebody's uploaded them all to YouTube, right? So you have access, a wealth of access. Type in DMX interview, just those those words into YouTube and you'll pull up all kind of stuff. That archive right there and then talking to and having the access, one of the things I loved about, you know, being in L.A. And I said this on the podcast was like, you know, everybody got to come through L.A. and and, into the West Coast. And so being able to catch cats and to talk to folks who actually were engaged in the day to day, (laughs) not just when the cameras are on, because we always know when the cameras are on. It's it's a different show, right? We know about Mm -hmm. entertainment. So like John was saying, it's like, it's easy just to take the prayer, but it's like, man, we got to take all these things into account. I remember, you know, I, I grew up on a lot of black Christian music. So Commissioned was one of mine. And so Fred Hammond was, of course, one of my go-to artists, right? You know, until I found out that, you know, in an interview that he was doing, that he had had a divorce. And I was like, why did this nigga ever talk about this shit in his music? Like... I ain't there. All these albums, you ain't never talked about this stuff. And that for me, like, just put a real sour taste in my mouth. And I think that's the part mm-hmm. of hip hop that people just don't like to deal with because they're going to tell you our true artists are going to talk about it all, all the things. Um, I'm forgetting the artist who was, uh, he's a little old school, but not. He was talking about how he was literally telling a story, and I am forgetting his name. Um, about how he was robbing this person, then the person, and then they were, they were thinking about raping this person's woman, and then it turns out to be like his mom and everything. I'm forgetting who the artist is, but he's telling this story. And I remember leading an entire Bible study on that with like nine nine young men. This was like 2006, 2007, and talking about those things just from that one song. I got to find the artist now because it's driving me nuts. But um. Those are not pretty things to see. And even the artist at the end, it was like, you know, trying to tell I'm, I'm trying to remember who this was. Um, but it, but again, those aspects of life, that for me rings truer than just trying to nitpick and give a lyric here, a lyric there. And that's what I try to do with subsequent texts and subsequent works that I put out was let me actually get into interviews. Let me get into aspects of life that led up to the art, if you will. Mm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. That's good. That's good. We have a, a couple of comments. If you have questions that you want to ask our guests today, please, please. put them in the chat. Um, no question is off limits. Um, we encourage you to join into the conversation. I know there's a few people watching, um, but if you have questions, um, let them know and I will be sure that they get a chance to answer those. So I like where this is going. I think that there is something super important about what you say, Dan, in terms of like looking into the whole life 
of the person, right? Looking, reaching back before we get to the point of the art. Um, I want to talk about what happens after that. I want to talk about the influence on young scholars, young people like you, right? In terms of understanding how you are making those connections and those inroads between your ever evolving understanding of faith and the divine and transcendence and the role that you made into hip hop because you didn't become a scholar then was like, oh, hip hop is cool. Like you were a part of the hip hop culture and there was something about that that was unique and resonant for you. There was no necessarily no distinction, right? Between the understanding of the divine and the understanding of your role and your participatory nature in hip hop, right? You grew up in it. It is a part of who you are. So talk to me a little bit about the reception, what's happening on the other end, not necessarily in the life of the artist, but in the life of the people that are that are listening to it. What connections are they making? If that makes sense. You talking about just people in general, like some of the connections they they have made or myself? Some both. Okay. All right. Well, I mean, I'll start with myself. I mean, I think hip hop for me has been in the culture of it. That's why I'm glad you like define that. Like it's bigger than just, you know, the music, which I find oftentimes a lot of even students of color who come into my class, because I, you know, teach a class, well, all of us teach like, these classes, right, on hip hop and, and culture and theology and stuff, right? And, you know, that will come in thinking they've only seen, right, the multimedia, the image of hip hop is only being music. And, um, I think for myself, it's been a, a healing sense of being able to know that I'm not abnormal. Uh, there's somebody else out there that, that thinks like this, that acts like this. And, and because hip hop is so grandiose, talk about this language and crossing borders. I tell the story a lot, but it's like, you know, I, I was fortunate enough to do a study abroad back in 2007. And uh, I said, well, you know, if I'm here, let me get some research time in, man. Let me figure out what I can do and, you know, interview some folks and blah, blah, blah. So I was in Paris. And I remember this was right around the times of uh, some uprisings, you know, and, and like in a lot of places, as we're seeing here in Chicago, right, the inner city, it was actually the places where the rich people lived. And the outer city, what we consider here in the States, the suburbs, was where the poor folks lived. Um, and so you could see that transition coming in, like I was coming in from the airport but to hear, I, I don't speak French, and but I do speak hip hop and we were able to connect on that level. So that level of isolation, that level of social forgetfulness, being forgotten by society, that's a universal thing. Them cats in Palestine is doing that stuff right now and then hip hop is at the core of that. That for me is something worth exploring much deeper and much greater. Um, mm. And so in, in that sense, even from the research, I would hear people say, man, you know, just being in a venue, being able to connect with a DJ, even a DJ and how the DJ, good DJs, I said this earlier this week, good DJs allow the crowd's energy, you know, and that vibe, however you want to define it, whether it's, you know, the spirit, whether it's theology, however, but that energy, that vibe um, is, 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 is allowed to be dictated. And there's something kinetic, there's something powerful about that. Um, and, you know, and I heard folks tell me like, man, you know, folks like Pac, artists like Pac were my counselor, my therapist. Now, that's not taking away therapists. That's not taking away psychiatrists. That's just simply saying that that music has be able, been able to provide a balm mm. then a space and time. Uh, you know, I, countless people that I interviewed and talked with that said, you know, I was on the verge of suicide and I'm not anymore because of this song or this particular artist and stuff. So I think. That for me is something big there. And I get that music is important and everybody, everybody loves music. There's not a soul on the planet, but you know, all of us, the meaning of it obviously is, is, is much more complex or, you know, how we translate that. So I think like what John's talking about these borders. Um, mm -hmm. But I also think that there's something big too in what is lost because we also have now a culture of hip hop that has been really captured by big corporations. And they're now the ones in charge. It's almost like you have artists that are almost intimidated to speak out in some of the things, right? It's almost like a, mm. hey, que sera, sera. I don't, I don't know if I want to engage with this. So it's very interesting to see some of those, you know, some, some of the more popular artists not engage with too much of the stuff today. And I don't want to knock a specific genre or a specific area of it as much as I'm saying it's very easy 
and David Banner talks a lot about this because he himself was caught in this after the you know Katrina um, a hurricane was that you know you start to talk too much social political stuff you connect it to a, a major record label that is feeding you your family and and you know and and really creating you old money um, mm. and so there's something to be said right like if all I'm being told is to talk about booty and hoes you know and and this is what some artists told me Jada Kiss being one of them and stuff man and so. That's something I don't necessarily have an answer to. I mean, because I get that that's what sells right now. And a lot of it that sells, right? And talking about, hey, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. So I don't know. Let me pause there. I don't even know if any of that stuff makes sense. I have, look like we got to question this too. No, he does. I'm going to I'm gonna show the question because I think this question kind of gets at it. And John, I'm going to let you add too. It's, it's really interesting in terms of like, mm -hmm. John, you were saying earlier about how all of what um, we we're talking about the DMX interview, all of what he said was captured as part of the religious, right? And not just the part where he was explicit in, you know, prayer or something like that. And even when you're talking about like the role that capitalism plays in the messages that are used within hip hop, and I'm just thinking about, I have a lot of questions, but I think this is this gets to JB's question, and we're going to show it here. JB says, "I'm curious, any pointers?" for parents or youth pastors such as myself regarding training students to enjoy hip hop and throw away the bones. And so this notion of throwing away the bones, I think reiterates the concept of like capitalism, how it shapes messaging and how we understand which parts of those messages are categorized as the religious, right? Mm -hmm. Are there bones to be thrown away, right? Mm -hmm. And if so, how do people who are training young people who are brought up in hip hop culture to understand their faith in the midst of it? I think, um, and this may or may not be addressing JB's quite, I'm going to, I'm going to try just building off every great thing y'all have been saying. Um, yeah. To, 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 to go back to this notion of hip hop is culture, you know, and hip hop is not, I think that's what really, got my attention the most you know not that hip-hop is rap music because it's not hip-hop is graffiti hip-hop is djing hip-hop is um b-girling and b-boying what yeah. the mainstream begin to call breakdancing this is um street language or what krs would call advanced street language this is street entrepreneurialism this is beatboxing this is production there are four core elements and some may go as far as to say they're nine this is a culture and I think, um, and and again, um, I think this is about this commercialization aspect. And many times when this is, when hip hop is wound up in confessional religious sectors, um, and I'm speaking right now about Christianity, um, I'm speaking about when hip hop has found its way into conservative evangelical sectors because most of the hip hoppers that claim to be Christian hip hoppers fall into mm. that type of theology. Um, yeah. So I say that to say and is, reformed too, and they're reformed, right? Because because y'all mentioned truth, y'all mentioned um, ambassador. Yeah, they're they're also come from a, a very very Calvinistic reformed type of theology. So you got that, and I think this is a part of. So that question, it strikes me in such a way, well, is the question itself tailored, like Tamisha was just saying, to that, to that, that, that sort of perspective? Because that perspective divorced hip hop from the origins. You know, mm -hmm. when you when you begin to say, OK, well, we're going to use rap music for this. Then you've gotten away from, first of all, the culture of hip hop, number one. And number two, you've gotten away from the origin of the element itself you know so so yeah i think i think what i what i would say and i and i i don't know if this is if this helps or not but i would say i think what's most important to that is when you have when you have a church and 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 you are introducing hip-hop to your congregations i would even go as far as to say this well krs says where well, every human is hip-hop because he said the hip-hop is an ancient civilization so for 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 KRS, hip hop is everything that mainstream societies and technologically advanced societies have told us that we need to do. So hip hop is the exact opposite of that. So it's it's the it's it's the exact opposite of these things that destroy 
the world in several ways from the environment to our psychologies. So mm -hmm. if you were to start with that and tell, okay, well, congregation, we're all hip hop, whether we like it or not, because we all have ancient ways of being, you know, we ancient ways of being that the system itself tries to destroy. I think that's a good inroad to start. Of course, you, you could go further than that, but I think that's a good. And then you, you could even contrast between people who may have messages that kind of reflect mm -hmm. what you may want to espouse in your church. You know, I mean, if you there's there's several graffiti artists, DJs, B-girls, B-boys, MCs who have those same types of messages. Mm -hmm. they, they may not be saying the same exact thing, but they're saying something that relates. Yeah. Yeah. I think I, I, I love that. And I think that, you know. JB is talking about, I guess, more adult content because they say um, into the veggie tales paradox. We want our kids to grow and know and love the Bible, yet we leave the adult stuff for later. Um, and later on goes on, yeah. to say, you know, no sermon on Jeff's daughter or no study of the rape of Tamar. I mean, I'm a little conflicted with that because there's so much in the Bible that we like if we're going to talk about the love of the Bible, there's so much in the Bible that we downplay and try to pretend like it's not adult rated in, in the first place, even as we teach it. So there's there's a lot of nuances in how we understand what is and isn't um, for 18 and over or however we want to categorize what is appropriate for people at a certain age to listen to. Um, but I think with that, as you're talking, John, about like the understanding of the culture, the understanding of the way that hip hop is steeped in this level of resistance, right? Resistance to things that destroy. I think that that is something that is an important, good starting place. And I even think back to my own classes in hip hop in college, where our professor started with soul music, which caught my attention because I'm a, you know, soul, neo soul girl. And just as like the voice of a generation in resistance to, right, in naming the realities of, um, Dan talked about this earlier, the everyday life of their communities, right? And in naming the resistance, right? This is the what's going on. This is the all of the different things. And that hip hop comes in, in that tradition, right? To continue to speak and affirm the lives of the people in their communities and continue to speak and dismantle, to speak and dismantle resistance of the institutions, the people, the what have you that were causing and killing debt and causing detriment to those communities. And so I think that as a starting point, I think is necessary. And then language, content, all of those things, I think is negotiable. I think that there are some things that are happening in our world right now that young people are seeing that you can't separate you know, you can't necessarily separate them from. But also, I don't have kids and I don't work in youth ministry. So there's certain questions about content and appropriateness that I don't necessarily have to address. I'm wondering if either one of you, especially Dan, with some of your, your work in your history and some of these spaces with young people, um, can speak to JB's question. Yeah, I mean, I think... Uh, you know, I mean, think about it as youth pastor. I mean, I've I've worked around young folks. I mean, this this is a pretty common question that comes up, man, in in terms of these settings. And um, I, I think the challenge with that, right, is I mean, I'll just again put all my cards on the table. I think most evangel well, most all of evangelical churches are going to have limitations as to what we can have conversations are. The nature of evangelical Christianity, or really Christianity in in the U.S., is that there is, especially when you work in those settings, there is a sense that if you say it or do too much, you can lose your job, right? That's going to be the first heads that roll. We're going to just cut this person off. We don't even want to hear any more from them. We will, we will terminate them and get rid of them. Um, now, I get that we live in a cancel culture today and, you know, people want to go, okay, you ain't should lose their job for something like that. I don't know if I'm ready to hop on that boat as much as I'm saying, okay, how do we come to some understanding? We don't have an understanding that, you know, and especially when it comes to, you know, you know, nefarious stuff like sexual abuse and physical abuse, right? It's like, how do we handle those things? And so how, you know, to answer the question, I mean, pointers for parents and youth pastors, I always tell folks, man, be as real as you can. But when you do that, you enter into dangerous ground because there are certain limitations within any youth ministry uh setting or youth context because ultimately 
that particular church or denominations, which is why I'm not a creed person or, or denominational type person anymore. I once was, but I don't know a denomination that doesn't like, you know, try to put out their own message to say, this is, the, this is the only and the right way. Right. And of course people, you say, Oh, we got non-denominational. I don't know if I completely get on, on with that. It's a challenge because young people today have exposure to so much stuff that there's no longer this essence of, well, the pastor or whoever the sage is on the stage, we can trust what they have to say because, well, guess what? I got, I got a device right here and I, I can, I can get information. Um, what is the relationship like? How do we look at hip hop as not just a tool, but an actual culture of engagement? One of the things I love about Phil Jackson, not the coach Phil Jackson, but my brother here in Chicago, is that he runs this whole thing called the house. And it is embedded and steeped. Everything from the top and ground up is about hip hop. Okay. And he's working with young people. Right. And for example, it's like he has cats coming. He has armed security because he's in the Lawndale community and there's, there's stuff that happens there. And he has a, a, a gun locker that he has folks, you know, put their guns in, you know, guns in there, you know, and I know that gets under some people's skin because they're like, well, why are they got guns to begin with? It's just like, you really want to go down and have that conversation, right? You know, right now. But the fact that he's just like, look, let's engage. Let's get you inside. Let's get you some basic skills, right? For those of you who haven't graduated high school, I mean, that's hip hop. Hip hop is about that community. It's not just about the music, but it's about that community. When you think about it, there's 10 elements of hip hop. And it's not, and yes, you got the DJ and yes, you got the MC and yes, you got beats and, 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 uh, um, uh, MCs, but you got entrepreneurialism, you got spirituality, you got a sense of self, you got uh, all those connections. Can an environment like that provide that? And I'm mm -hmm. becoming more and more convinced that religion becomes very problematic because it 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 issues itself and and really pushes itself onto a situation to say no, this is the only way. And therein lies the problem because you're gonna you're always gonna run into something that doesn't fit into that particular block. Um, you're, we're seeing some of this stuff even in higher education, right? It's like cats that are still lecturing on shit they was developing 25 years ago. It's irrelevant, but they're tenured and they're emeritus. So, you know, we can't mess with them and stuff, man. So it's a constant evolving thing and a challenge, man, because, you know, young people are going to keep changing, you know, and ever since adolescence can be traced back thousands of years that's not a new phenomenon just that came out in the 50s some scholars say oh it was in the 50s no 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 no, no. We, there's evidence that stuff has been going on in young people's lives for thousands of years it just we've got it labeled now there's always going to be older folks who look at the young people and be like this generation and i'm say that as an older person myself about to push 50 who's now looking at it like mm, those young hip hop heads, man. Why well, I can't even understand them. Back in my day, we had EPMD, and you can understand everything they said, you know. And and I don't want to become a fundamentalist, even in my own sector. Mm -hmm. I want to continue to grow, and I want to continue to develop. Um, and but it's a challenge. It's a challenge in in places like churches. So that's a yeah. that's a long winded answer to that. Yeah, now yeah, you yeah. brought up something. I, I just want to jump in real quick, Tamisha. I'm sorry, mm -hmm. um, but no, you brought up something really, really important there, Doc. Um, I mean, this whole this whole idea of orthodoxy is not just restricted to confessional religions. No, mm -hmm. orthodoxy shows up in this hip hop purist thing, you know, which I've been guilty of. I, I I'll, I'll say that um, there yeah. have been times, but yeah, you know, I think that's very important to keep our minds open. You know, yeah. Mm -hmm. Um. I want to shift the conversation a little bit because uh, I have a question and I'm interested to know uh, your responses. How are we dealing with the patriarchy, the misogynoir, mm -hmm. um, the sexism that seems to run rampant both in hip hop and also particularly in church communities, right? And in what ways are they reinforced at those intersections, right? How are we how how are we how are we addressing um, those particular concerns and the ways in which they can reinforce each other? Woo, that's a good one. I and I say this. Um, I had a great guest on 
a couple weeks ago or, or last week, I can't even remember anymore. Um, Emily Joy, and she just wrote a book, you know, called Church Two, which I highly recommend folks going and reading that. Um, because it gets it to me. Sure, the name asking. of the book again? It's just it's it literally the the name of the book is is hashtag Church Two, um, mm -hmm. and right. she talks about her you know experience through that and. I will say this, absolutely. Any conversation we're having on race, socioeconomics, gender, human sexuality, 100 years to 150 years behind that, we still live in a society. And because hip hop culture, and this is the part that I feel like is really a hip hop culture's Achilles heel is, you know, there's a lot of blue collar cats and within blue collar culture, right? It's a very strong, defined, narrow role of them this is what a man should be. This is what a woman should be. And it really is that binary. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, I don't want to have to deal with quote unquote, that gay shit. Right. I mean, you know, let's, let's, let's keep it real. And I mean, think about this Byron hurt in 2005, put out an amazing documentary called beyond beats and rhymes. And it dealt specifically with this, what you're talking about. They ain't been shit since. Okay. <laughs> 16 years and we got little things here and there but 16 years and people are still and and people were a lot of cats were squirming on this on this video now of course you know we when we know some of them you know you know now of course with you know the reckoning with me too and everything and a lot of these cats have been shown like yeah y'all was doing that so i there's a major problem with that and i think it it stems, but hip hop didn't create it. So let me just be clear there. I don't think hip hop created any of this. Uh, this is endemic to U.S. patriarchal society in general. Um, uh, so I don't want to like hold hip hop hostage to the fact that, oh, well, they call women bees and hoes. So did Elvis. OK, <laughs> so let's let's be clear on that. So did John Wayne. And, um, you know, let's let's look at what that means. I think. As I've worked with young men, there's a real struggle to define what manhood is. And if you come from an environment, this is not excusing anything, but if you come from an environment where everything is taken from you, where you're told you're, you ain't shit, where you're, you're shown that really what's important, that a building, a business is more important than your life, right? You, you know, a broken window is more important than your life. Um, you're striving for some sense of power. Um, and as off cued as that may be, uh, if I can exercise that through my sexuality or my own body, right, this, this idea of space and place within your body, then unfortunately that comes across oftentimes as very skewed and in one direction, meaning that I have to dominate, uh, you know, if, if I'm a man, I have to dominate a woman, I have to leave that woman, right? And then of course you add in religion to that and it makes a very nasty stew, um, for that. The patriarchy is deep embedded within churches all over the place. And this is, again, this isn't just Christianity. I mean, no offense to any of my other brothers and sisters and fam that's in uh, the Abrahamic faith, but you got it in Judaism, you got it in Islam, right? Um, so I think we have to ask ourselves the question, what is it about women having ad agency um, and agency over their body that makes it so difficult for some men to engage with. Um, and that comes out in a lot of different, you know, ways, especially in, in hip hop. So you said a lot there. I don't have any answers. I can define it other than I know I'm raising a daughter uh, that is exposed to this, who has been sexually harassed on campus by a little knucklehead that listens to all these rappers with Lil in the front of their name. Um, and we have to, and that's that's just that's not a knock to anybody with you and Lil, whoever. But my point being is, is that that young brother, you know, who 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 sexually assaulted his his idea of women is very one dimensional. But that's also being reinforced in the home. Uh, I also say it's not just men. There's also women who I interviewed as well as is who talked about. I want a man who can be a real nigga. I want a man who can you know who can basically defend my honor. There's a lot being said in statements like that. Um, and you see this shit play out in the academy. I mean, look at, you know, look at how many men, you know, how, how long it's taken. I mean, think, I mean, re actually read anything <laughs> on womanism and you can begin to see some of the struggles, particularly as black women have had, even in the academy, 
to deal with um, and just even to try to establish themselves as reputable scholars. I mean, what kind of shit is that? So I don't know. I'll stop there. But that's a big question. Yeah, I want to add this yeah. nuance part to the question. And then, John, I'm going to let you go, because I think what Kathy asked here adds a level of nuance to what we're talking about. Um, they say a good question and they asked uh, about how capitalism capitalism fuels the massage noir in both yeah. um, hip hop culture and the church. And I think this is a really good you know, point because I do want to address that, you know, there is nuance within that. Yes, you know, massage noir and patriarchy didn't start with hip hop. I agree. Um, but I do think that it is something, a conversation that we have had to contend with. Mm -hmm. for for some time and especially a conversation that we've also had to get in with in the church and oh, those yeah. forces together i don't know if it's like a captain planet moment you know when your power is combined we don't know we don't know what's going on talk to us john let us know give us all the answers. yeah this is this is this is a <laughs> deep excellent question tamisha by the way shout out to Giram. he's in the house the homie Giram young definitely on respect respect um yeah so I think about this this way. Um, I think that hip hop and hip hop in its inception is kind of it's deconstructive in its in its origin, I think. And so, but when something is that volatile, because creativity is volatile. Cre creativity, I don't I don't necessarily think has any yes or no, right or wrong, up and down. Creativity is, is, is creativity, but creativity in hip hop was codified, mm -hmm. not by just the commercial aspects of the culture when it became, when rap music kind of separated itself from the other elements because commercial record labels saw it viable, not just that, but even in the creation of the Zulu nation tenants, um, what Africa Bambada's whole understanding of what hip hop as a philosophy could be, which was based on several things from Judaism, Islam, Christianity, Buddhism. There's several things that came up um, in the creation of this codification of what the philosophy of hip hop would be. And some of those things weren't deconstructed, including mm -hmm. gender, including mm -hmm. religion, including. And so there's there's several things that hip hop in its codified form picks up that may, that are challenged in its origin. And so, and, and, but, but, but see then, if we go, if we say that, then we have to also ask several other questions. Well, as we've, as we've said, we've already asked the, what is a man, what is a woman question. But then we have to also ask the question, well, do men and women exist? Does race exist? Do, um, and then we have, and then, and, 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 and I think hip hop allows us to play with all the, all, all, all these questions in its inception. The other question we'd ha have to ask are binaries such as race and gender, are they in themselves divisive? So can I, can I, can I have, can I eliminate racism without elim elim eliminating race? Can I eliminate gender biases without eliminating gender? Um, so, so then these questions and these, I'm not answering the questions. I'm just saying that if we really look at the, the multiplicity, the chaotic multiplicity of the, of the origin of hip hop's creativity, then we, where we come back to these questions, which, which I think that we can, and the questions that have been raised that, uh, uh, that you've raised have been addressed by some people. And what they've done is they've went back to the origin of the multiplicity of creativity and said, okay, well, if this, if the world was being reimagined, then why can't I reimagine gender relations? Yeah, I know hip hop for years has had a certain trajectory, but is the trajectory the essence of the culture? Have we, and I, and I, and I think a good example of some of this is the get down. I don't know if, any, if, if anybody's seen the get down, the get down is a two season um, show that kind of delves into the beginnings of hip hop culture in the, yeah. in the mid 70s. So yeah. everything is played with in there in ways that I, I don't think had been played with in cinema before. You have the header with the, the, the non heterosexual piece played with, you have the race piece played with, you have um, the 
misogyny played with. You have all of these things that sort of brought back to the volatile primordial origin. It's okay, well, we didn't have to build a world we did with the foundation we had, so why did we? Mm. So mm. I think that's kind of weird. And there and there and there and there are people who address this, you know, a a a a Asia One, Queen Heroin, Eternia, like the list goes on of people who invincible, shout out to Anomalies crew, a Pony B Fly MC, all of them. But yeah, I mean, I think that just to just to just I'll stop there with that. But I think, yeah, it's it's I think the resources to reimagine a world of less um oppression are all in hip hop. Have mm. we looked close enough? Yeah, I think that that question that you 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 pose that we didn't have to build the world we had, but why did we? I think that that is, that is really a key question if we're gonna say that these art forms, cultures, the religious, the transcendent is, is for the sake of reimagining, right? It's for the sake of creating new worlds. It's for the sake of liberation, right? Why then do we get caught up in creating the same worlds that we had, but by a different name? Like, why do we do that, right? And there's yeah. something at the core of that. Yeah. And I think that this question kind of gets to that. We can go back and forth about this. We are running out of time, but I do want to address JB's final question that talks about um, if either of us have had success in leading young people deeper into theology via hip hop. And I want to trouble a couple of things. When you say theology, are you particularly meaning the traditional notion of the study of God? Are you meaning their understanding of how they experience God and community? Like, what do you mean when you're saying theology? And are you saying via hip hop, meaning using the particular cultural artifacts like music? Um, because a lot of the young people, if they grew up and this has been their culture, then it's not, I don't think it's that parsed out. Do you know what I mean? Um, and so I think that there's a little bit of troubling to that question that I think addresses the way we understand how to, how to um, think about hip hop culture, right? And it goes back to our notion of what is the actual culture and not just the music. I don't know if that's where you're going, JB, but I think that you bring up some good points that can create a bit of a teaching moment for anybody who may be watching now. Or, or later on, but um, I want to open this up, and I also want to include this as your your final comments. Maybe you can address some of what JB is saying, or any of the questions that we've had. Offer some final comments, and then we can peace out. Well, I'll say this. I mean, I think this is part of what I dreamed about when I started writing the Soul of Hip Hop was robust conversations around this. Um, I remember in the book, in, in some of the edits, I actually was trying to toy with this notion of patriarchy um, and switching up the pronouns of, uh, of God. Uh, and I remember my editor at the time looking at it and being like, this is just gonna distract people. I'm like, well, it's distracting me that we're always calling God a man. So I'm just like, like, can we, you know, can we, can we, you know, and ultimately there are certain fights. If anybody who's ever written a book, there are certain fights you can win, certain fights. I mean, I had to fight over the cover and a fight over just the title of it. So it was like, I would love to come back to this. In fact, I'm co-editing um, an issue right now uh, on womanism and hip hop. Anybody out there that has some stuff, I would love to get your material. And this is specifically uh looking at exactly what Tamisha just brought up and we're exploring it from a lot of different angles the music the videos the culture non-binary binary you know what i'm saying you know can we talk about wap can we not i mean so let's you know meg d stallion all of that stuff is on the table so if you're interested hit me up i think it's it's a conversation and yes it will be turned into a book um, I'm lined up a publisher now. And so those of you, especially those of you Academy Pubs, hit me up. I will also self-promote, say, faith. This is we've been talking about still on. You are breaking up. Can you hear us? Are you still with us? Is he being raptured again? Mm -hmm. I think he's rapping. I don't think he, 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 don't think he knows. Being raptured? Okay, yeah. now you kind of back. No. Okay, now we got you. Oh, am I back? Yes, sir. Need you back again? Oh my There's God! What? Storm, you know what, what I'm is, saying? 
Your time. Oh my God! You lost all the old jewels, dog. You got to okay, just... rewind because you were going it's... deep. You got to rewind that one. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I don't know what y'all cut out. I'll just say, look, I'm editing a journal right now, looking at womanism within hip hop. And so, if you got an essay, uh, you got something you want to say, bring it. This is this is the spot, and this is going to be turned into a book. Uh, I've got two publishers interested right now. Um, and uh, this is something that I had hoped and dreamed about when I was, you know, first writing the soul of hip hop. So um, I've always wanted to continue this conversation. I feel like I'm in a position now uh, to finally do that. And that's part of the thing, too. Right. As I feel like in the academy, at least I'll speak from that. You got to get to a certain point before you can really, really lay into what it is you really want to talk about. Right. And so I really finally feel like I'm at that spot. So if you're this is something that I've been wanting to take up that question that you just posed to Misha. Um, so please, if you're interested in writing uh, for this and contributing, hit me up. I'll also self promote and, and just say, you know, we've been talking about this on profane faith for the last four years. Uh, we're on season five now. And this is something that comes up a lot. I've actually had all of y'all, Misha and John on as well, along, along with Christopher, uh, Dris Chris Driscoll, uh, Monica Miller. I mean, we've we've had these conversations a lot. So I want to point y'all these have been going on. Um, and I know, you know, JB asks, you know, about you know, the theology question with young people. I mean, this is something that I feel like I just do. But it's not necessarily always under the veil of Christianity, because theology for me is much bigger than that. And how do we understand the cosmos beyond just Christianity? How do we understand, right, the experience and dimensions of advanced civilizations uh, that have both been here before um, and will probably come after us. Somebody will be looking at our shit in 3,000 years and being like, hmm, what if they had had computers then, right? You know what I'm saying? So all I'm saying is, is that these are some great conversations. I'm thankful for it. I'm thankful for Ark. I'm thankful for Tamisha. Thankful for my man, John. We always, we always talk like this. Whitehodge.com, more resources there. I try to put out a lot of free stuff. You can connect there. Um, and please let's continue the, um, uh, let's continue the conversation. Hopefully I don't get raptured anymore. Cause I'm not going, I'm not <laughs> go going anywhere. But I can see if I was going somewhere, but I'm not going anywhere. So. That's hilarious. <laughs> yeah. I think that's, that's powerful. Once, once again, since, since, since this is your day, doc, I just got to shout you out once again for what you just did. You know, you opened up a publishing opportunity for people. And since I've known you, you know, you've always been about that. You know, you've always you've always been about reaching out and, you know, opening up spaces for people. And that's something that, you know, I think we all should model. And I and I appreciate the way you've done that for me. You've opened up space for me to do things I wouldn't have been able to do if you hadn't. So, you know, I mean, I really, really appreciate that. Um, but, yeah, this 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 question um, about, yeah, theology and hip hop. See, I guess. What I would say, and, and JB, I haven't been in the evangelical world or a confessional world for quite some time. So you could take this. I don't know if this, this, this is this is helpful or not, but I would I would say I think the first step would be to get a sense of what your what your youth find most important. What do they value about life and what gets their blood pumping? What gets their because. Because I'm gonna say, well, that's well, that's their religion. Whatever gets their blood pumping and whatever consumes them and whatever lens they look through to see the world, that's religion. So for me, I thought it was evangelical Christianity for a long time, but it really was hip hop. Mm. I was I, I, I had left evangelical Christianity before I even knew it. But I mean, years before I admitted it to myself, because what what was most important to me, the lens through which I observed the world as a totality from everything from living in the world itself to justice was through hip hop. So I would begin to ask your young people, what do you find most important? And I think that gives you a good inroad to what is theological for them. Mm, I think that is an excellent word and a great space mm. to end. I wanna thank you both John and Dan for an incredible conversation. Obviously you all know these conversations don't hear, end here. They continue on both in you watching this video, you continue to comment on this video. We'll also post this in our monthly newsletter. 
So um, including the information about the Womanism in Hip Hop Journal um, and any other information that we can get from um, John and Dan. So if you are not subscribing to the newsletter, um, head on over uh, to our website, arcsreligionandculture.org. You can find information there. You can just shoot us an email. We'll make, you, we'll make sure you get that. That newsletter drops every uh, first Friday of the month, and it'll feature not just some of this incredible content that we're doing here, but also announcements and things like that. Our next event, just as an, um, just as an announcement, will be June the 30th. We will be doing a fundraiser with the very own um, Patrick Reyes in celebration of his Ooh. latest book, The Purpose Gap. Right. We will have personal time with him and also some really uh, great artists who are gonna be responding artistically to his book. Um, that will be a fundraiser. Prices uh, will be um, donation based. There is a minimum donation, which will include a free book. So tickets will go on sale around the first of the month. We will keep you posted on that. But if you have any other questions or want to have more conversations for hip hop, hit us up. We'll try to get you connected to these two scholars. But until then, I'm going to go and have some food and get some rest on because I've been staring at this laptop forever. But it was so <laughs> great to see you all and to continue this after party. And we so will good to be with y'all. Yes. Peace. Absolutely. Peace, y'all. Peace, y'all. Oh, respect.